really, we're delighted that um, this particular workshop is being sponsored by the new National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. And <coughs> it, will, um, it will be um, advertised nationally. The only thing is, the list isn't going out until later in the week, so we are really the first workshop in the, in the national series. So what we have agreed to do is to capture some highlights of the workshop. In the, the National Forum have uh, put their seminar series into strands, and we've been put into innovations in pedagogy, which I thought was quite nice. We have academic staff, we have researchers, postdocs, postgrads, undergrads here this morning, so um, we should get really a good mix. So I'll hand over to Nick. It's great to be back here. I was trying to work out on the plane how many times I come here, but I don't think I've quite reached double figures, but it's getting close to it now. Um, so I feel like an old friend uh, coming back. Uh, many of you I won't have seen before. Um, it's certainly the biggest audience for a session, unless it's been a conference one that I've uh, uh, come for. Um, students as partners is, not a, is a term which is beginning to be used quite a bit, but only really beginning, and it's still uh, uh, very much clarifying what we mean by it. Um, I helped organise for the Higher Education Academy in the UK a summit uh, in September. We, we had 24 hours with uh, various people around the, uh, the country trying to tease out what we meant to it. And I'm in the middle now of actually writing a publication, co-authoring with a, a couple of colleagues at the Academy, specifically on this topic. This is the first time we've actually presented specifically on this, so it's a bit of a, um, a trial run, so I'll be very interested in getting your uh, feedback on it. There is a feedback sheet. If you want to fill it in now, you're already very welcome, but uh, uh, <laughs> get that out of the way. OK, um, this is the structure of today. We're going to look at some of the nature of students as partners, stand back from it, look at a conceptual framework, um, look at some case studies, uh, look at some issues in implementing some action planning. That's broadly the, the themes that we're going to develop. It's going to be very interactive. There will be lots of uh, uh, chances to ask questions, but lots of discussions going on at the tables uh, and, and feedback to the, uh, the group. As I said, this is becoming quite a hot issue, uh, but different languages are used by different people uh, about them. So, student as producer uh, is one term which gets used, students as researchers, students as co-creators of the curriculum. They're just some of the terms which are uh, uh, being used. Um, here's some recent reports and publications. Students as change agents. Uh, and then two from the students themselves from the NUS in, in the UK. A manifesto for partnership came out uh, uh, last year. Um, oh, at the end of 2012 it came out. Uh, and then quite recently, uh, the guidance on the development and implementation of student partnership agreements. That comes from a, a, a group in Scotland uh, called Sparks, which have been very innovative in, uh, across Scotland in getting students involved uh, in various activities, particularly of quality assurance and quality enhancement. Um, and some recent books, or a book about to come out. Um, in fact, all uh, uh, two of these are now out. This came out um, uh, about a year, uh, last, last March I think it was, student engagement. This came from um, Birmingham City University. Um, the middle one's a huge tome, about 550 uh, pages of it, uh, came out at the end of last year. Uh, and the one on the right is coming out in March of this year. Um, so this is quite a hot issue, and student engagement is another term which gets used quite a lot uh, in this area. So, a hot topic, but a, a very recent one. So let's tease out a little bit about what we can mean. The Higher Education Academy in the UK, which is a sort of a body um, like your forum, um, uh, uh, has been having students as partners as one of the themes, uh, particularly since uh, Phil Levy uh, joined them as uh, Deputy um, Chief Executive there. Um, and uh, on their website, they talk about two aspects of partnership. Uh, there's students as partners in sort of learning, teaching and research. And then there's students uh, um, uh, involved in partnership where it's much more about the enhancement of the learning and teaching practices and policies. So they're recognising two elements uh, to that. And that's where we started the, uh, the summit uh, uh, last September. Um, and in writing this publication, um, uh, we developed it from there and adding uh, rather more to it. Now, if you can't read that, on the very back of the cover, on the handout, you do have a, a copy of this, so if you can't see it on, on there. So we've got the two elements, learning, teaching, and research, and quality enhancement. 
But we've added another dimension to it from what we're calling co-learning, co-designing, co-developing at the top uh, to co-researching and co-inquiring at the bottom. So we end up with actually four different uh, activities. And they've been shown deliberately as four overlapping circles uh, because there is a lot of overlap uh, between them. They're not distinct. Um, uh, there's clear overlap um, uh, occurs there. And these are tendencies rather than you know, absolutes. And we haven't tried to distinguish between the size of the circles. Um, if you did, this would be by far the largest. Students involved in their own learning, teaching and assessment. Uh, that's the sort of active learning element of the agenda. Uh, that's a huge one, um, uh, by, by far the largest uh, uh, one. It's certainly about learning, teaching, research, and it's involved in them uh, co-learning, co-design, co-developing uh, some of their activities in an active way. Now, a subset of those uh, um, are what we call in the subject-based research and inquiry where the students uh, are sometimes called undergraduate research and inquiry, sometimes students as producer. Uh, it's the area where students get involved in um, doing research and inquiry into their subject-based uh, discipline. They become researchers in their own right. They become the co-developers of knowledge um, uh, 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 rather than uh, sitting passively. Uh, in many ways, it's a subset of this, but there is a distinct literature now, and has been for um, 10, 20 years now, uh, on that area. And so it's, it's the, in the moment between the learning, teaching, research, the co-research, and the co-inquiry. Then move to the right-hand side. These will be smaller circles. Um, whereas these are potentially for all students, those on the right-hand side tend to be for certain students, the selective uh, students, uh, often on a, on a volunteer basis. Some students get involved, again, in co-researching and co-inquiring, but actually into what's going on in the classroom. Um, uh, often called scholarship of teaching and learning, subtle, uh, where the students are, in this case, uh, you know, traditionally, um, you know, those of us who are interested in, in, in subtle, uh, we interview the students. The students become our, our, our guinea pigs, I suppose. Um, they're the subjects of our research. This is the case where the students become the researchers there, often co-researchers with us, investigating the nature of the teaching and learning taking place uh, in their classrooms. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, again, it's not for every uh, student there, as, it's, as scholarship of teaching and learning is not for all staff. And then finally, in the top right-hand corner, this is where uh, students get involved in curriculum design and pedagogic advice and consultancy. Uh, so the students may actually be involved in helping design the curriculum. Um, uh, actually, a uh, quite a common one is actually developing learning resources, which will be used by other students. Um, but they may be part of a team. You know, you're going through a revalidation process, you redesign the curriculum, and you have students as partners uh, in that process. Uh, or in some cases, they may be actually acting as consultants. We very commonly have situations where staff sit in on other staff's uh, uh, sessions. You know, it's a, a, a peer um, uh, you know, feedback system. There are a number of institutions now who are getting students who are doing that, actually sitting in on staff, you know, not staff who teach them, because there would be conflicts of interest there, but staff in other faculties, and actually seeing and observing what's going on in the class from a student perspective. Um, and they'll agree what they're going to investigate, uh, and they may go and hold a focus group with a group of students about it. And they will get different things out by talking to students than we would as members of staff, or staff uh, doing that. So, four different ways in which students act as partners. In their own learning, teaching, assessment, in subject-based research and inquiry, in engaging in scholarship of teaching and learning, um, and in curriculum design uh, and enhancement. Um, and in the centre, we're saying, what we've identified so far are four activities. But what's bringing all these together is the process by which these operate. And we're choosing at the moment to talk about that in terms of developing a learning community where the staff and students are part of that learning community. And sometimes others, maybe employers, uh, will come in and in certain cases, if it's employment-based learning, or people from the community and community-based learning, uh, there will be other partners there. But the key two members are the staff and the students as partners uh, in this uh, process. So that's where we've uh, got to with the model. I'll elaborate a little bit more of it uh, uh, later on. Um, but I want to get a first flavour on what you think about some of these ideas about getting students involved uh, in this process. Um, and one, two of you have experienced this before. Um, we've got room here in, in the set. I'm going to get you to do a line-up. 
Um, uh, and I'm going to put a statement on the screen. I want you to come and stand the extent to which you agree or disagree with that statement. And then the idea is you start a conversation with whoever happens to be standing next to you about your take on that particular uh, statement. So I'm going to be quite provocative. Um, and uh, the statement is, it should be the norm that students are engaged as co-partners and co-designers in university and department learning and teaching initiatives. Whatever your take on that, if you strongly agree with it, can you go towards the window? Uh, if you strongly disagree, towards the door, could you stay in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Please invite you to come and just start a conversation. <laughs> oh, one or two people who are climbing out the window um, uh, and are strongly agreeing. Uh, why are you strongly agreeing with that statement? Well, because we both thought that it was the best way to keep students engaged, mm -hmm. really keep them paying attention throughout. Okay, and another reason for people in the strongly agree end? Um, we're a scholarly community where um, everyone's views <coughs> come together to um, affect um, bigger and better outcomes. Yeah. And, and it's not we're right and we're wrong, but we know more than you do. Okay, I get the flavour. Probably over half were, were, were in that area. Some of you couldn't get in that area. <laughs> Quite a few probably say, is sitting on the fence. Mm -hmm. But let's go to the other end. Um, people who would disagree with that statement. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm at the very extreme end of the uh, room. <laughs> I totally agree with the concept. My only uh, uh, agreement is with the term co-partners and co-design. It's like you're taking the students from their level way up to our level. Uh -huh. I'm not saying that they are looking at them uh, in, in, in a different way, way or, or um, um, disregarding their uh, role in the <coughs> But probably I would just use or soften the term or use okay. um, maybe um, an, another simpler term like a helper, uh, um, collaborators maybe. Oh, okay, my, so my, my only objection. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, we're, we're, we're unpacking some of the words. You know what? Do, what your take on co-partner and co-designer is, and you think that's too strong a term? But I think the, the other thing we were saying was that the, the even more objectionable words are <laughs> student <laughs> <It's> co designers <laughs> right. because that because designing the course is something that mm -hmm. requires foresight and knowing where it's going, mm -hmm. and knowing mm -hmm. the entire context of things in which it fits, and that's something that is almost by definition, the student is not likely to have. There, there, is, there is still a, a position of mm -hmm. expertise. OK, and there's an expert novice dimension that's coming, coming through here. Uh, um, and so, as, as well, I was going to say that, to a certain extent, for certain courses and programs, there are external requirements, which no matter what the student might want, mm -hmm. yeah. they have to be met. Yeah. Like, so for example, oh, yeah. in the accountancy or in the actuarial mm -hmm. degree programs, there are certain targets which have to be met for the, the quality of the degree for the student will not be adequate. Yes. Well, is that where the core part comes in? Mm -hmm. What you're doing together. I mean, times change, and sometimes we're pretty stuck on what we thought was the norm a long time ago, and now the students are coming in. We're not necessarily first year students, but as they develop further in their course. But these are inside externally. These aren't internal measures. The, the internal measure is how how many exemptions do we want the students to make? So there's potential eight in the extra one. Do we want them to have eight exemptions? So we have to meet these requirements, and we have to set exams with this standard. If we do not meet those requirements and set exams with those standards, the degree will become a different degree. So, 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 so part of that yeah. policy is around understanding yes. the framework and the context. Yes. The yeah. students are still learning. But I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if say, a first-year student can necessarily have the context of, like, I would say, for myself, when I was a first year student, I did not have the context to discuss those things by nature. But if you had the right to discuss them, you probably would have learned and progressed further and faster. I was focused on different things. I, I did let's do well in my first year, but I was not. I was interested in the discussion that was going on at the time, but I was not interested in what was going forward at that time. I wasn't looking ahead like that because I had not, 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 made the decisions, but I, I just made like well, like I was kind of just saying well. This is what I'm interested in, and I'm going to just look at this. I'm not really looking ahead. Okay, fair so, enough. I think you wanted to come in. I was just going to say that it, even up to November, with regard to co designers, I would probably have been a bit further up. Mm -hmm. Probably not at the far end, but somewhere mm -hmm. in the middle. And I went to a session at a conference in November. Uh, it was the University of Bristol. We were doing something about students as co designers, partners, and so on. Mm -hmm. There were three students in the room, 
and a few skeptics like me. <laughs> and um, the students, there was a Belgian, German, and a Bristol University student, and they said, you know, we, we realize our limitations. We're there to just ask questions from a different perspective and make comments from a different perspective. But mm -hmm. they knew what their limitations mm -hmm. were. They weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. I think their expectations were not that they were going to design their own curriculum and have a new course. Right. So then I'd say that it becomes that. really, really important to define what you mean here as co-partners and co-designers because yeah. it can fall clearly mm -hmm. on two quite mm -hmm. different extremes. The other thing I would say in my experience teaching here through a four-year program is that the students themselves, your average student at the moment is still coming in from secondary school, mm -hmm. so they're 18, mm -hmm. and they leave here when they're 22. There's huge developmental changes, intellectual and psychological, mm -hmm. during that period, and they're different creatures um, at the end of four, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to watch, but mm -hmm. they're different creatures at the end of four years than they are uh, in the first year. So applying this in the same way in the first year, curriculum, for instance, would be a very different story than applying it in fourth year, mm -hmm. and you know, those, those issues I think have to be okay. thought well, One or two others sitting on the fence, so to speak. Oh, yeah, we're not sitting you know? on the fence. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they're splitting now, but yeah, I'm giving the opportunity to say something. <laughs> by keeping them on, back to the point that we're keeping them on focus, keeping mm -hmm. them on what the course is meant to be. Yeah. Um, co means 50-50 almost, even mm -hmm. partner. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think they can ever be fully equal partners mm -hmm. in designing the course. Mm -hmm. Um, you need perspective, and mm -hmm. like, well, first years won't have the same perspective perhaps as third and fourth years. Yeah. So um, I know it's a cover off statement, but I think fresh eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Betty, last comment. Um, yeah. I, I, I look at co design as, as being um, no, not everybody's going to do the same job in this design, but students can <coughs> feed into part of the design, staff member into part of the design, and you're, you're working as a team. So you're not all say this is what we're going to learn but you might the students might say this is how we enjoy learning or this is how we'd like you to approach something yeah, I think that's I'll just interrupt there. I think it's critical in a sense of co-partnership doesn't mean equal partnership, yeah. or it doesn't mean that everyone's bringing the same thing. It, they, you're setting it up as if the students are going to be as expert as as, as, as we are in lectures. Mm -hmm. Clearly, nonsense. Uh, so we, we're, we're bringing different things to the table. I think is the argument. The Please. proportions vary on everything. You mm -hmm. want to like on one thing could be fifty-fifty, mm -hmm. or thing could be five percent, but that five percent could still mean a vital feeling of input from the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Instead yeah. of just and and th this is very common, and this is great, I think, it's the first time I've done it on, on, on this one, but it's actually really polarising some of the issues and actually surfacing them so we can actually uh, discuss some of them. I'm not going to give all the answers uh, now because we're going to continue discussing this. You know, hopefully by uh, the end we'll have some perhaps different perspectives. Perhaps we ought to do another line up at the end and see if anyone's changed their mind. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous, everyone goes that way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just going back to the, the diagram now, I just want to, just for a few moments, unpack a little bit more, but we've already done it, some conceptual frameworks which are relating to the different ways in which students can be partners. Do you remember what I said at the beginning? I think this side is potentially for all students, while that side, which most of you got hung up about, uh, particularly on the co-designing one, is for some students, some you know, selected group. It's, it's never going to be everybody do it, but I think there is going to be contribution <coughs> from some students. And I think they have a, uh, my argument would be they have a valid contribution to make and we're not making uh, uh, sufficient use of that resource uh, which is there. But let's just tease out some of those uh, elements for a few moments. Let's catch up again. Um, I was involved in the last uh, five years at my uh, institution, the University of Gloucestershire. We had, in UK terms, a, one of the centres of excellence in teaching and learning. There were over 70 of these across the country. Uh, and I was co-director of one called the Centre for Active Learning. Um, and this is very much what we were, uh, were pushing there, uh, was trying to get, move the institution to, to uh, yeah, be a more active learning institution. We chose the word active learning because actually it was difficult for people to argue against it. You know, we want to be a non-active institution and that. Um, we could have uh, you know, uh, talked about experiential learning or inquiry-based learning. Then it's probably you know, people who say, no, I'm not interested in that. Though our particular perspective on it was very much an inquiry-based route to involving the students actively. Um, some of you will be familiar with uh, Kolb's um, uh, model, uh, cycle of experiential learning. We've put a, a, a slightly different take on that um, and translated some of his language from where you get experience, reflection, 
generalization from that and then testing it um, with something which I know one or two people here are very keen on coming from Harvard, the performances of understanding uh, uh, initiatives, uh, which some of you will have heard about, uh, uh, no doubt, here. But that's just, uh, I'm just teasing out some of the conceptual frameworks which underpin some of the different elements uh, here. Um, I'd hoped, actually, I, I meant to include this in the handout. It's a rather complex diagram. But first of all, flipped classroom, another term which is getting used a lot here. How many of you haven't heard of the flipped classroom before? Quite a lot. That's interesting, I'd say. Um, it's, again, it's another term which has really taken off. Um, it's actually not a new idea. Um, it's been around for quite a, a long time. It used to be called the inverse classroom, uh, now more commonly called the flipped classroom. Uh, and it's the idea that you flip uh, the activity. What we tend to do in the, uh, uh, most of our sessions is, you know, in a lecture theatre, we'll, um, they'll, they'll listen to us largely, but not necessarily exclusively, uh, and we'll put that as the main area, we'll get the material uh, over. In a flipped classroom, you get the activities uh, to learn the material uh, outside the classroom. In other words, you present them uh, in terms of handouts, in podcasts, in videos, in directed reading. Uh, the idea that students have done at least some of that before they come in the classroom. You then use the classroom for discussion, problem solving. Um, uh, and then you set some more work for them to reflect on that and apply those uh, um, uh, more generally. So you're taking out work, uh, it, the flip is, is, is taking what the activity uh, is occurring. Um, uh, and yeah, several of the, uh, oh, many of us have actually been doing elements of that, uh, maybe not to that extent, uh, for, for many years, but this is the term that's being used. Um, uh, and my argument would certainly be that you know, we have actually very limited time face to face with students. Um, you know, depending on the institution, 10, 15 hours perhaps a, a week. They should be gold dust. And I think we waste a lot of that time by simply transmission mode of teaching uh, and getting the material over there. I think we need to take, not, I'm not against that, um, I think there are times when that's appropriate, uh, but the balance I think is wrong and we need more time for discussion and uh, problem solving uh, because that's where the learning is more likely to take uh, place. So it's changing the balance. Uh, now, this diagram comes from somebody who's been writing about the flipped classroom in some way and has linked it to Cole's experiential learning model and combined those two ideas. Um, and she talks about um, starting with uh, experience. Is it, before you get into it, give students some experience, give them flavour what it's uh, about and the various ways I won't go into how they might get some experience, uh, get them engaged. Um, then deal from the experience deal with what, um, uh, and in a variety of ways, some of which may be in the classroom, some of that, deal with the concepts, the, you know, the underlying ideas which are unpin underpinning something. Look, you've, you've done that thing, let's stand back from it, and there are, you know, there are theories to under uh, underpin your, your learning and what you've uh, been doing. Then you get them to actually reflect on the process and various ways in which they might reflect uh, uh, doing things, and that's what she calls the meaning-making uh, uh, session of that. Uh, and then finally, um, she moves into an area uh, uh, where students actually come up often with their own projects to actually demonstrate and apply all the learning that's coming. So they're starting with some experiential ones, getting some concepts, reflecting on it, and then applying it again. There's a, there's a virtuous circle uh, there in, in, in terms of what she's talking about. But again, very much active learning, um, and it's related at least to the, the flipped classroom idea that we're rather uh, more generated. Now, there's a lot of evidence around um, on the beneficial impact of these types of way of teaching. In America, they call it high-impact activities. Um, the uh, the NESI, the National uh, Engagement of Students Survey, which they do in the States, um, uh, enables them to identify particular activities where learning is going to take place. These are more effective learning, you get deeper, uh, more retained learning. Um, George Q identified 10 different activities uh, there. Some of these are in North American language uh, there. I'm not concerned with the, with the detail of them. But they're all involving some active learning in a variety of ways, inside or outside the classroom. Um, and that's just one piece of work, though uh, a very strong piece of work, uh, showing the benefits uh, in terms of learning, of getting the students involved uh, uh, actively. So that's the first so that big circle on the top left hand uh, uh, corner. Let's move down to the uh, bottom one. Now, how many of you have seen this diagram before? Oh, it must be more than just you, Betty. I mean, I've been here enough times. 
Right. Okay. Um, this is going to be on my gravestone. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's honestly, you know, I reflect sometimes, you know, I've been in higher education now almost 40 years, and I am known for this one diagram. This is going to be, this has been more cited, more reproduced than anything I've ever done. Um, so I'm, I'm quite proud of it, actually. You know, at least there's one thing uh, 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 you know, people remember me about. And I've got a few more people I'm introducing it to uh, uh, now. Now, I didn't actually develop the ideas. This actually came from a um, colleague, Ron Griffiths, at University of West of England. Um, he uh, produced some uh, ideas and put them in text. I was be being asked to write a chapter for a book uh, edited by Ron Barnett, and I was playing around with these ideas and put them into a diagram. I get more cited for this than, than he does uh, now. It just showed me the importance of uh, showing things diagrammatically. Now, what is there is just identifying different ways in which teaching and research can be linked. Um, if you look at the axes first, students as participants to students frequently in audience, and left to right, emphasis on research content to emphasis on research processes and problems. And then four different ways in which students can engage with research and inquiry. Um, Ron said, yes, let's use the term research-led when we're talking about the subject matter, the content of that, the, you know, the, the topics we're, we're lecturing on or uh, uh, covering. I put it in the bottom half, the diagram, because that is the most common way that students get the content. It's in a lecture mode. It tends to be rather transmission mode. It tends to be... Uh, 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 they're frequently in audience. Uh, it needn't be, but that's the, the tendency. Research-oriented, we're now swapping to when the students are learning about the research techniques, the methods, the ways of thinking, like an economist, like a civil engineer, whatever your, your subject is. Clear on the right-hand side, it's about research processes and problems. Um, it could be in almost any of the boxes. I put it in the bottom, uh, uh, um, or top or, or bottom, because uh, there are numerous different pedagogies we use for teaching research methods and techniques. <coughs> but a very common mode is uh, to give a, a lecture to, say, 400 students um, uh, uh, about research methods and techniques in X. You know, it's often a second, uh, uh, you know, mid, um, uh, halfway through their degree. That's quite a common name for a uh, title for a, a, a course. Um, and then afterwards, you might split them into practical groups or seminar groups, depending on what the subject is, to explore those in, in, in more detail. To the right, Ron said, research-based, uh, let's use that term when the students are actively involved in doing inquiry and research themselves. This is where they become the producers of knowledge rather than the consumers of knowledge. This is the learning by doing mode. This is where inquiry-based learning, problem-based learning, project-based learning, case-based learning, all those terms uh, would be used in that top right-hand corner. They're the active uh, learners. They're learning about the subject matter. They're learning about the techniques uh, by doing. Um, I then had a gap in the top left-hand corner. Um, uh, Ron hadn't got a, a term which fitted in, in, in my model, so my one little contribution was research tutored. Um, I tend to use that term when I'm talking about when learning takes place through discussion. Um, now, that could be a wonderful one-to-one -one tutorial situation when you're, you have a, you know, somebody doing an undergraduate dissertation and you're supervising or at PhD level, you know, it's very common. It's a wonderful way of learning. But we don't have the resources to do too much of that. But equally, you could have a discussion in a class of 400. You've outlined a problem, you've asked them to turn to their neighbour, discuss it for a few minutes, and you ask a few of them to feedback, and you feedback on their feedback. Discussion is taking place, and learning uh, is occurring. So there are four different methods there of getting students involved in research and inquiry. Um, and actually, we do all of those. Um, and the most common reaction is, oh yeah, I do it, I just don't call it that. Uh, and uh, uh, my argument is, not do we do it, but have we got the balance appropriate? Um, uh, and that's how the model's been mostly used, is take a three-hour session that you're running, or a whole semester course, or the whole programme, and ask yourself what proportion of time do students spend in those different boxes, and is that really what you want? Is that going to achieve your objectives? And that will vary according to the students you have, the subject you have, the level at which they are, the culture of the institution, and all the other factors is that. And the best thing is to, if you're team teaching on, on a course, or certainly on the programme, is to have a discussion about it. And you'll have different views about where the balance should be. But it just allows a conversation to take place, and only you can decide what is appropriate for that uh, uh, course. So that's a, a conceptual framework which is uh, fairly well known now uh, for the bottom left-hand corner. Let's move into the bottom right-hand corner, and that's when students are involved in doing subtle scholarship of teaching uh, uh, and learning. 
Sometimes referred to um, uh, as students of change agents, a term which came from Exeter University, where they've been doing a lot of this for the last uh, seven years or more. Um, it's quite a long quote, comes from uh, Liz Dunn uh, uh, there. I'll let you read that, uh, first of all. My take on that quote is, I often say, this is where we go beyond listening to students. Uh, in, in, certainly in Western countries, we're, we're very good at doing the listening aspect, hang students uh, on uh, you know, staff student committees, uh, we'll do, you were talking about doing surveys, you know, we listen, we get feedback from the students on every course we do. We're, we're actually very good at that. Um, but I'm interested interesting in going beyond listening to where actually students become involved in some of the decision making um, uh, and are feeding into it, are joining us at the table to make decisions. So we don't just listen to them, uh, we actually act on some of it. Then they become partners, it doesn't mean we do actually what they say. No, there's a discussion going on, but we are uh, going beyond listening uh, to actually involving them as change agents. Um, we'll see some examples of that in a, in a moment. Uh, this is a diagram that comes from that uh, book by uh, Liz Dunn and Zandastra. Uh, uh, again, they, they rather like uh, you know, <coughs> two by two diagrams. Um, in, in their case, um, uh, they've got emphasis on the student voice to emphasis on the student engagement, um, and the emphasis on the university as a driver to the emphasis on the student as, as driver. So we've got students and evaluators, very common, the student voice. This is where most higher education uh, it does a lot. We do some the students as participants in decision making. You know, the, 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 key, the, the student reps, the, uh, the, national, the, the, you know, the student union uh, people get involved in some of the decision making. I'm more interested actually in the bottom half of this diagram, where they become partners, co-creators, they become experts in their own, experts in what students are experts at, not to say what we're expert at, and students as agents for change. And we'll look at some examples in a moment where we'll tease some of those out. Um, but it's quite common in quite a lot of institutions now to get students investigating what's going on in the classroom, coming up with their own ideas. Saying, We're interested uh, in, you know, I'll give, give you one example from Exeter. Um, they have a system whereby they give uh, <coughs> small amounts of money to groups of students to go and investigate what's going on. Um, and the critical thing is that they have once or twice a year a, uh, uh, an institution-wide conference where the students come and present their findings. And the critical thing is all the senior management have to come to that. It's a three-line whip. So the, you know, the vice chancellor, if he's actually in the country, comes there, but all the, the top management, all the deans, all the heads of departments are there. Uh, and a few years ago, uh, one of the areas they got interested in um, uh, was the, the use of clickers in the classroom. It's now become very common, but you know, five years ago that was, that was as new. And some students in the business school said, we want to investigate the student experience of using clickers. Um, uh, and when they presented their findings, they came up with so many benefits that the students were seeing they got from the use of this and how it helped their learning, that the dean of the business school stood up at the end of the meeting and said, all right, you convince me, tomorrow I'm going to order 4,000 of these so that every class in the business school from the first year up to taught master's level has this technology available. I don't believe if a member of staff had gone into his office the day before and asked for that, he'd probably shown the door quite quickly. Students can actually be more powerful uh, in actually influencing decisions often than see some of us as actually members of staff. But that's an example of students doing a, a project, reporting back and actually making a difference. They're acting as change agents. Um, there's quite a lot uh, of uh, how involved students are in this. Uh, this is a model which has been referred to quite a bit, Arnstein's uh, uh, model of student engagement. It comes from community participation, um, uh, but Cathy Bogle in particular at Glasgow University has used it to apply it to students as co-designers of the curriculum uh, from what she's calling a dictated curriculum where there's no interaction. Students aren't involved at all. We just say this is what you get, you know, take it or leave it sort of thing, um, to where this is, a, I think, a contentious one, students in control. That is highly unlikely to actually occur in teaching and learning. Um, uh, we've got a diagram I'll show you later where we actually stop at that point. But the degrees of student involvement in that to where I think the top level is partnership, a negotiated curriculum. But 
these are equally valid ones um, uh, for different circumstances. And so you move forward the degree of which students are actively involved in participation. And you can map different courses, uh, different things are there. And I'm not saying one is better than another, I'm just recognising there are differences uh, uh, there. Uh, and this is the model that we've developed, which is on the bottom of the, the, the diagram, um, where we're taking from staff make all the decisions to where students and staff work as partners. Uh, and then we have in, the, in the, the, sort of the middle area where staff listen to the student voice and where students make at least some of the decisions. So again, you can map different courses a, a, along that. Um, but the, we're saying the transition, uh, maybe uh, we're doing more towards the right hand than we're currently doing, is probably the, the room. We're not saying to do everything on the top right hand, don't, don't misunderstand me. And then the other one, just at the top, well, we've got it on the, the screen, just saying, of course, this partnership works at different levels. It could be, as we've talked about a lot, the individual module, the courses we teach. Um, uh, but it could be at the programme level, the department level, the institution. It could be across discipline. Um, it could be international um, uh, as, as well. And I've got examples of students working internationally. Nice to see you. Um, uh, 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 in these sort of ideas. Uh, students are not the experts. Yeah, we've got to start from that, that perspective. But they do have experience and expertise in being students. Now, many of us are many years away from being students. We've forgotten what it's like. Um, uh, uh, people are bringing different things to the table. That's very much, that's Alison Cook say the quote from, from her. Um, I'm going to slip through several ones because these are things we were going to do, but change your mind. Um, I just added on that model now. We've added on, of course, there's a national international context. Uh, to that. Uh, we're, we're still writing that section at the moment, so they may not be the boxes that work out, but I'm just uh, uh, recognising that. Uh, and I've said on the, on the front page, this is work in progress uh, in the hearing, so things may change, um, partly as a result of dis you know, discussions here and, uh, and elsewhere we're having. Um, uh, uh, but um, watch for the, the final publication, which hopefully will be out uh, in not too long, when we finish writing it. <laughs> um, come back to it, I actually... Betty may actually recognise it. I gave a keynote at a, a conference in 2012. Uh, uh, it was actually just the students of change agents we were talking about then. I ended my talk um, with that statement, saying that was my, you know, my, my aspiration of where we, we should do it. And I thought, oh, that's a nice and provocative one, which is why I used it as the, the lineup, because it did help to unpack things. Um, you can use that sort of lineup with your own students. Um, uh, or, you know, that, it, and it, the, the trick is having words in there which people will interpret in different ways. And that exactly happened here. What do we mean by co-design? What do we mean by student? You know, is it all students? Is it some students? Uh, um, because you can have people at both ends of the spectrum seeming to argue against it, and actually they agree. <laughs> um, uh, um, so I think if um, students as change agents, as partners, are going to be truly integrated, it actually gets to what the nature of higher education is. It comes down to quite a fundamental debate. I think we're, we're really challenging here. Angela Brew, in a slightly different context, uh, talks about the notion of inclusive, scholarly, knowledge-building communities. Now, we talked about learning partnerships being the centre. This is a very similar uh, uh, sort of idea here. Um, it's a partnership mode that she's in. That is actually written in terms of doing undergraduate research in, 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 in Angela's case, but I think it's more, more generalisable. But if we want to challenge some of the things, sometimes I think we need to think outside the box and do things a little differently. And I think this is an area where there's quite a lot of thinking outside the box here. I think it's a, it's a new, I think exciting area. I think it's the way education is. I'm surprised how rapidly this idea has taken Taken off. Um, uh, I've been to so many conference sessions in, in the last 18 months with this as a theme that's uh, coming. I think it's, uh, it's time has come uh, and now's the time to get on, on board and try out a few things. So good luck to you. But I will end with Tess, of course, again. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all very much. I am around here. If, any, if you want to put some table, chairs around the table, we'll continue the discussion. We'd be delighted to do so. All right. Just question back around the institutional barriers to change. Uh, one of those comments that, you know, wherever you go to every university, there will be some people who say there are institutional barriers to change. <laughs> now, I'm yet to see a list of what those barriers are. And some of those, I would say, are our perceptions of what those barriers are yeah. compared to reality. Yeah. And actually, I would be keen to hear from anyone that's got a list or could send me a list, <laughs> you know, confidentially, saying here are some barriers. Mm. You can try and break those barriers down. Because mm. often in talking in different, across different silos, if you like, at the university, 
you know, those barriers do start to disappear. Yeah. But, but I agree there are barriers to change, but some of those are very much in our control. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, they, many of them are overcomable. Um, and sometimes it's being bloody-minded, as you say, and just doing it and, and getting that experience. Because you know, any new area, you're going to have innovators who have got to start it off, start the ball rolling. Yeah, Betty, come in. I like the idea of pester, student pester power because um, <laughs> there was one really good example here in UCC when we introduced Blackboard, when it, when it was mainstreamed, and um, a few lecturers were using it. Um, but then the students began to demand it yeah. of every other lecturer, and that's how everyone was on board. And there was a very steep uh, uh, growth in, in, yeah. in the use uh, of, of Blackboard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a huge way of getting change. There's a demand there, we begin to fill that demand. And, and the students are actually very powerful you know, in demanding that, that sort of change. I'm trying to say, if you can work both ways, you can say if there are no barriers to change, but it's sometimes those invisible barriers of fear that are the problem. And an awful lot of the change is being implemented by people who are human in the area. And the difficulty is the standards that are expected. So, like, I think that we have a very traditional way of setting exam papers, for example, and the exam mm. paper context and level and everything from year to year stays very much the same. So if you vary how you teach a course and it works, it's fantastic. But if you vary how you teach that course and it doesn't work, how do you make up the time that you lost in doing that and still assess to the same level mm -hmm. this year? And, and mm -hmm. where then do you make the change? You know, so it's it's it is ideal, but it's definitely not easy. And maybe we should start discussing. Uh, at a higher level, how to overcome this and how to allow for that change. I yeah, think. yeah. I, th I think assessment is the, the most difficult area to get into. Yeah. Uh, it's the least well advanced. Um, it's relatively easy to talk about active learning within the, within the classroom, and many, you know, a lot of us do that. Getting students involved in the assessment is, is rarer. It's not uncommon for peer feedback. Um, uh, sometimes, as somebody was saying earlier about uh, uh, peer, you know, students as teachers, you know, peer learning. Um, but I've got one or two examples of actually students actually involved in setting the exam paper. Um, you know, it's a negotiated assessment, you know, and, and the question actually comes through that. It's almost like an open book exam, but they, they, con they contribute to the ideas of what's going to be examined. And some have gone further than that and actually say, at the beginning of the course, we haven't yet, you know, the, the broad subject area is covered, but the topics we cover within that is, is open to negotiation. Um, uh, our QA procedures often you know, constrain that, but there are examples out there of that negotiated assessment, much more partnership learning then. So students are actually choosing what to be assessed on, on things that they want to learn about, um, not just be given. Uh, no. But even in creating those questions, they learn more. Of course. Question, yeah. Yes, yeah. There's always that, that adage of you know, the best way to, to learn is to teach. Yeah, that works so well. Yes, I think, from. I think that was a good answer. It kind of threw it back to us. You know, we were kind of thinking of the process and how we get going, but it threw it back to us. And I like the idea of a student coming into the university thinking, actually, I'm going to be asked, I'm going to be expected to you know, contribute in some way. To go with the fact that we're a structure of a college from the university and, and how is it going beyond all that? Mm -hmm. So there are. Um, yeah, challenges and issues with that. Um, we think we need a champion, a uh, champion at university level would certainly, uh, and I'd have to have them, I noticed that it was in one of the case studies where it was a big success with the top 25, it really wasn't led from the front. Yes. So I think when you have a champion and everybody else that includes the college structures and then the department of schools see this as a, as a college-wide initiative, then it's much easier to, to get on board. Yeah. We also said that Yeah, I mean, things wouldn't change if you listen to all the voices that said it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to try it. And I think we're at that stage, particularly on the right-hand side of the diagram, of still doing many one-off individual projects. So we've got to learn that experience. Um, I always say start small but think big. 
uh, and you need to accumulate that one. Um, uh, and as those stories began to be told, oh, it worked in that context, then you began to you know, think of you know, the mainstreaming issue, about how you, how you scale it up. Um, and I think there are too many projects at the moment, which are, as I was saying earlier, um, uh, uh, not sustainable. Um, uh, and, and one of the ways to make things sustainable is to get involved in the curriculum. Do it for credit. You know, what, what, you know, what, you know, this involves time for people. You know, what, you know, what do students get out of it? They're all very busy people. You know, what do they get out of it? The money isn't there to pay them always. You know, occasionally you can do that. Much more likely is to get it built into the credit structure so they can actually do it and get, earn something towards their degree in doing it. It's much more likely to be sustainable. Thanks very much for challenging us. I mean, it, it, is, um, it is about risk taking in, in some cases and about thinking of the process. So you've given us quite a few ideas and um, hopefully uh, some, some people will have identified with and can either strengthen or build on, on that with their own disciplines and schools and institutions. Because, as we said in the little uh, piece that went around, with 19,000 students, all with unique talents, you know, and we should engage them. So thanks very much. Thank you.